So welcome to our resident panel discussion here at the Gardens at Town Square. My name is Joan Retman, Area Community Relations Director for Era Living. We are here today to learn about the Gardens at Town Square from some of the best possible resources, our residents. I recognize from working in my role where I really serve as a guide to help you and your families make this very important decision that it's really not an easy one and it requires a lot of questions to be asked to really discover if any community may or may not be the right fit for you. And sometimes it's hard to even know what questions to ask, especially if you're fairly new in the process or you're looking at a lot of different options. So our hope for you today is that you will not only learn valuable information about the gardens at Town Square specifically, but that you'll also learn some tips on what questions to ask so that you'll have these tools in place to be able to interview, if you will, other communities to discover if they may be the right fit for you as well. It's wonderful having our residents to offer their time here to offer their expertise because they really are the experts. After all, they've already been through this decision-making process and are happy to share their knowledge with you. So let's go ahead and meet our residents at this time. So I'm gonna do just a quick introduction so you know who's on the call to help you today. And let's start with Audrey. So Audrey, if you just wanna raise your hand and wave so they can see you there, there's Audrey. Audrey's been a resident here at the Gardens at Town Square for about three and a half years. And then let's go with Dave next. Dave has the great plaid cotton shirt. There's Dave, yep. Yeah. Dave's been here for about two and a half years. We have Van, Van wearing a great scarf up top there. Van, would you wave please for about seven years here at the garden, there's Van. Thank you, Van. And then lastly, we have Joe. Joe is our newest resident here with us on the panel. Joe, if you don't mind giving a little bit of a wave. Joe's been here for about uh, two months or so. So thank you again to all of our wonderful residents to, uh, to help us out with, um, with our guests today. So we're gonna start with uh, some of those questions that I mentioned are ones that are really commonly asked that we think most of you would know about. And this first question, I would like for each of our panelists to go ahead and answer this question. We'll start first with Audrey. And the question is, why did you decide to start looking at retirement communities? And why did you choose the gardens? Uh, so Audrey, Let's go ahead and start with you, please. All right. Um, <clears throat> I have been living in a two bedroom, two bath condo in a two story building on the second floor, which meant I had outdoor stairs. Didn't bother me, but it did bother my aging dog. But that wasn't the reason why I really decided to look at retirement communities. Uh, I have been living by myself in the condo after my husband had passed. And I found that uh, I was becoming increasingly isolated when I had two injuries due to falls, one outside and one inside. I realized that it was no longer a safe place for me to live in. And having been urged by my kids for many, many years, mom, you have to move. It's time for you to move. I decided, well, maybe they were right and knew more than I did. So I did begin to look with my son and we visited several different communities, but really as soon as I walked in here, I knew this was the place for me. You could just sense it. And I'm here for three and a half years now and not sorry at all that I chose the gardens. It's been a very nice experience. Thank you, Audrey. We look forward to hearing a little bit more from you later when we ask some other questions, more specifically about the types of offerings and events here, which a lot of people are attracted to. Uh, sometimes some of the reasons why they choose our, our community. Let's go next though to, um, to Van. Van, I know you've been here with us for, for seven years, the longest of any of of any who are on the panel today, would you be able to please share why you really got started looking and why you chose the garden? Well, I lived in a property, on a property I refer to as the homestead. It was two and a half acres. 
and a lot of maintenance and it got to be too much for me to accomplish with my energy. And I decided I wanted to devote my energy to other activities than maintaining what I said is the homestead. Um, I started looking with my daughter. My daughter uh, reviewed some places and then we took a tour. And when I walked in the front door, there were two things that um, made my decision immediately. One was the warmth and uh, kindness of the front desk. And the second one was Tehuli's um, piece in the lobby because I'm a big Tehuli fan. And I thought if these people appreciate Tehuli, uh, it's the place for me. And I've never regretted once. Uh, one of the things that um, really pleased me was the um, array of things to do and uh, sources of activity which have been curtailed now by the pandemic, but that will pass and we'll be back in full gear once again. We all look forward to that. <laughs> I'm looking too. forward you, to Van. that with great glee. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you, Van. Uh, Dave, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm Dave Markander, and I moved here from Sammamish. We lived out in Sammamish, had a really good-sized home, good-sized yard, and good-sized swimming pool, all of which required good-sized maintenance. The older I got, and the long stairway from the first floor to the second floor, as I began to need hip surgery and so on and so forth. And it was just the, the workload was quite a bit. And although my grandchildren were disappointed when I chose to move and leave them not the ability to come to the swimming pool every day, uh, we did some searching in Redmond and uh, in Seattle. And uh, we got hooked into ERA and I, like someone else has said, when I walked in the front door here, I was sold. I love the location. It's close to just about anything I want to do. Perfect, Dave. Thank you so much. And Joe, how about for you, Joe? Well, as I said, I've only been here a couple of months and I really enjoyed it. And the thing that uh, uh, tipped the scales for my moving here was I had a couple of calls and and uh, I couldn't drive anymore. And so uh, I knew some people that lived uh, at the gardens and they were very pleased with it here. And uh, now that I'm here, I just enjoy it so much. The food is, is excellent and I don't have to prepare my own meals. And uh, despite the pandemic, I've uh, met those around me and, and those that I knew previously. And uh, uh, I knew I'd made a proper decision. That's great, Joe, thank you. And a, a follow-up question for you, Joe, um, and some of the other panelists have touched on this a little bit, but for maybe other family members being involved in the decision-making process, how involved were other family members in making the decision versus you ultimately choosing the community? Oh, it was primarily my decision, but my daughter, lived in Redmond's was a great help because I became really a lot of junk and she helped me get rid of it. Ah, that's a great segue actually into the next question, which is what was the hardest part about moving? Who would maybe of our four panelists like to address that question? If you could raise your hand, I'll maybe start by calling on one of you. Dave? What was the hardest part? The hardest part about moving, yes. Well, all the work that was required, but what made the hardest part go a lot easier for me was my twin daughters who with their families live in Seattle. And they were, have been from day one, more and more and more than healthy, health, helpful. And uh, I love them dearly. We'll never be able to thank them sufficiently for all the help they provided to my wife and me. It's nice having a support network around that can, uh, that can help with the move. Not everybody has resources around them to do that. And so sometimes 
when say downsizing, getting rid of stuff, which is usually the most common uh, answer to that question is getting rid of all of my stuff. There are resources that can be offered in any era living community and, and other retirement communities too, to help with that process a little bit. But I know from speaking to um, some of you, some of our panelists here, you have shared a little bit of feedback too about how you worked through downsizing or how you got rid of some, uh, some of those things. Van, could you speak to that a little bit? I know you offered some really helpful points uh, well, earlier was, in our Thank you. I, I was very, very fortunate, I believe, because I've spoken with other folks whose uh, children and grandchildren didn't want any of their furnishings. And uh, contrary to my family, my grandchildren wanted um, my antique furniture. And so now I have the pleasure of going for Thanksgiving and other holidays and, and sitting at my own table and chairs and looking at my own side uh, furniture. So that was, um, that was a real blessing to me. I didn't have to go. And then I had a surrogate daughter who literally moved in with me and helped me move. But I still have two storage walkers here that I haven't seen personally for seven years, but uh, my kids take things in and out of their Christmas trees and tires for the car that I just sold and other things. So that was my entree to moving. Very good, thank you, Van. Uh, does anybody else on our panel have any tips or anything they would like to share about downsizing? Audrey. <laughs> okay. Yeah, downsizing, of course, was really, very, very difficult to do. And one tip is to let go of any sentiments that you have about objects that you may have loved and cherished for many, many years. So my advice is simply, when you look at these things that you have loved and had for many, many years, remember, you have loved them, but it's time for someone else to love it as well. And that made it a little bit easier to remove those items. Um, I have tips. My tip on downsizing is that you really have four ways to downsize. And the first is if you're lucky that you can give um, your items to your children or friends or neighbors. So I gave away what my kids would accept and that's the key. The second thing is to sell. And there are many vehicles available for selling items. There's Etsy, there's um, other internet uh, outlets, there's um, half price books, there's um, consignment shops like For You Furnishings, which were very helpful. And then you can donate things and there's Goodwill, there's Habitat for Humanity. They are wonderful because they will take big pieces of furniture that other places may not. And last of all, just trash. And so keeping those four things in mind and trying to rid yourself of sentimentality and thinking that others will enjoy what you have, that's the way to go. And that's what I did. And that's really helpful, Audrey. Breaking it down into those categories um, helps to simplify it in a way and, and makes a lot more sense. Great, great feedback. How about, you know, we, we've been in this pandemic now for going on 11 months. So, you know, we, we are all looking forward to getting back to normal at one point and hopefully in the not so distant future. So when we go back in time a little bit and remember what life had normally been like at the gardens, how would you describe that to, to someone else? What is the gardens normally like living here outside the pandemic? Who would like to speak to that? Van? Well, it's one of the most delightful places on earth as far as I'm concerned because it has an activity for everybody. That's when the pandemic is gone. There's art, there's cards, there's all kinds of activities. And I think uh, the resource uh, group that presents those 
uh, when we're able to indulge them is just goes overboard uh, supplying us with things to do. I can't say enough about it and I miss it terrifically. I can't wait till the pandemic is a word we've forgotten its meaning. All of us feel the same. <laughs> Thank you, Van. Um, Audrey, I know that you're involved in so many different things here uh, uh -huh. normally as well. Would you like to add any comments? Oh, sure. I can be very specific about um, what we have here. And I've got a number of things that I can show you. Pre-pandemic, we have a wonderful department called Life Enrichment. And what they have provided us with are calendars. And let's see if you can see that online. There you go. Um, this dates back from January. So every month, and I hope that once the pandemic is finished, we can do it again. It's a list day by day of the various activities that we have here. And, uh, you know, I could go on and on with the types of activities like performances and um, recitals and going out to restaurants. But I wanted to show you some other things. We also have a garden resident council and both Van and I happen to be officers of the resident council. And so this is just a copy of minutes that are always available for residents to read. And the purpose of the resident council is to keep residents up to date, ask questions, answer questions, and pursue projects that benefit all of us. Another activity that residents look forward to a great deal is the resident newsletter. And that's called the Garden Gazette. And that comes out every two months. And it's chock full, it's 16 pages, and it's chock full of different interesting items for residents. Um, one more activity. And um, if you are a gardener, we've got garden boxes. And so here are some pictures of various um, garden boxes that uh, we can take care of. And uh, many of us are very active in that. Uh, one more thing I do wanna show you, which I had forgotten about before, which is life enrichment also produces a schedule of events that are on the in-house television channel. And these include exercises, because it's so important to continue to exercise. Um, we have items of events like the wonder of dogs and if these walls could talk, there's afternoon yoga. And so during the pandemic, we still have activities going on, which is very, very helpful. Let's see, have I forgotten anything? Oh, we have knitting. Sorry, we have a knitting group called the Knit Wits. We knit for charity. <laughs> and when the pandemic is over, we've got bridge groups. We have um, clubs for men, clubs for women. It's a wonderful place. There's really a lot to talk about, isn't there? We could do an entire presentation just on the just on the typical activities. And you also touched on the internal channel as an example of one way that a lot of people have continued to stay engaged even during the pandemic. Is there anyone else that would like to make any additional um, comments about how you've been staying engaged during the pandemic? whether it's through the in-house channel or with family Zoom calls. Can anyone speak to that a little bit more? Okay, we'll, we'll try a different question. I know we covered a lot with that one question as it is. So thank you for that. Um, I, I'm curious, what would you say is your favorite part? If you had to pick one thing whether it's in the pandemic or normal times, what would you say is your favorite part about living at the gardens at Town Square? What stands out? Dave? The food is absolutely spectacular. 
We have the best chef in the world. She makes only spectacular food. It's all good. Whether you're having breakfast or lunch or dinner, you're going to be happy. And I love it. Very good recommendation. <laughs> Making me hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Is there anything that that you know one of you might comment on or if someone were to ask you, is there anything that you don't like? So far you've been sharing a lot of wonderful things which might be expected. Anything that you don't like about living in a community setting? Well, in the silence, may I go back to your first question? I think the camaraderie of the people here and some of the new friends that I've made has been just wonderful. And so people are friendly and it's easy to make friends. And I think that's one of our biggest selling points. It's a very welcoming, a welcoming group, a welcoming atmosphere. Right. We hear that feedback a lot. Right. Uh, thank you, Van. Um, this, oh, and Audrey, yes, please. Yeah, I just wanna add that I have found the staff to be very, very welcoming and friendly and helpful. And keep in mind, as we are getting older, it's so important to know that help is at hand, that you can rely on your staff and uh, in the various other uh, uh, committees <clears throat> like life enrichment uh, to help you. It's there if you need it. And I think that's reassuring to know. And that's part of what I do like. Um, as far as not like, um, you know, in any community, having lived in a condo, you know very well that you are a community. And it's very important to know that you can help others as well as having others help you. And so I have found as I walk through the halls, if I see another resident, it's, hi, how are you? How are you feeling today? Can I help you? That's part of the camaraderie that Van had mentioned. And it's deep. And it's here. Great, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're getting close to about halfway into our time. So I think I'll go ahead and ask uh, one more question. And then I'll open it up to the opportunity for, for those of you who have attended today to ask other questions that haven't been yet answered. Um, and so this is a question that will be for Dave, actually. Um, and Dave had asked to want to speak to this a little bit because of his own personal story, if you don't mind me sharing, Dave. And that's to talk about a special part of our community. So within the gardens at Town Square, we have a very special neighborhood known as the Terrace which serves those that have advancing memory loss. Dave, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would. And I, I guess that's one thing I'm probably more grateful for than anything else. Uh, my wife, Meg, and I moved here two and a half years ago and she had been dealing with memory issues for two or three years prior to that. And uh, it became pretty obvious within about a year after we moved in that her memory was really getting to the point that she needed the availability of the memory care unit in the terrace. And so she moved into an apartment there and I moved in downsized to a one bedroom apartment for myself up here on the, well, I have to be on the fifth floor, but Saris is on the second floor, but I could see her every day. I could visit her. She was taken great care of. Uh, the people down there are wonderful, both in caring for people with memory issues and in just caring for people and being nice and loving and feeding them well. And they all, they get treated just as well, if not better on the second floor as we do everywhere else, because those people have greater needs. And my wife, unfortunately, did continue to go downhill and uh, uh, my daughters and I were here with her when she breathed her last breath last April but it, I, it had nothing to do with getting any lack of absolutely perfect care 
and I will always thank the Lord for the care she got and where she is now. God bless you. Thank you for thank sharing you. that. Thank you. Hey, so I think at this time, uh, I'm gonna pause on some of the questions that I've been asking and we'll have an opportunity now for, for each of you, if you wish to ask some of your own. I'm gonna glance over at the chat for just a moment and see uh, what questions I can answer from there. And then we'll come back to the rest of the group, which at that time, if you do have a question, it would be important for you to have your video operating so that I can perhaps see you raise your hand and that way I can call on you for your question. So let me look at the chat for a second and looks like there is a question about how this community, the gardens at Town Square, uh, compares to another retirement community that is uh, close to us. It's in the same neighborhood known as the Bellatini. Some of you might have heard of that community before. And what, what I can share with you, maybe some of the differences actually really applies to most other retirement communities in this area that would not be an era living community. So I'll explain it from that standpoint, that there are some things that are unique uh, to really this company as a whole, which then of course are specific to the gardens. And one of those would be the type of relationship that we have with the University of Washington which really stems back to the, the origins of when this, um, when our company started back in 1987, starting with a relationship with the School of Nursing and then expanding into a relationship with the School of Social Work and Pharmacy, which has led to our communities having social workers as part of our team, consulting pharmacists. It has even helped with the type of um, COVID-19 protocol that has been in place for several months here, so much so that our, our company was actually the first in the entire country, in the entire country to employ broad testing for COVID of all residents and staff. So it's, that relationship has been instrumental for helping shape those kinds of things. So that's, that's one example. Um, for, for the Gardens of Town Square, one other difference maybe specifically to that community and several others is that Era Living is based on a, a family owned, um, family owned and operated company that's local. So sometimes when you have different owners and managers that might change over time, which can affect differences in services that you, that you experience with amenities, services and residents might um, feel the impact of that too. And, with Air Living, that's been you know completely consistent with same owner and manager, of course, for um, for all of our communities over the past 30 plus years. So, uh, if you have more specific questions, we can go over that a little bit later. But I want to give an opportunity for um, more questions that might that our residents might be able to speak to, maybe about life within the gardens, other questions about apartments and availability. We can always address those with you um, uh, directly. Uh, let's go over to another question that has popped up here from Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. What are the opportunities for walking around outside? We have a dog to watch walk each day. Audrey's ready for that one. Okay, Audrey. Okay, as I mentioned before, I moved here with my aging dog. I had a standard poodle who at the time that we moved was oh, well, about 14. Anyway, when you walk out the back, not the front of the building, the back of the building, there is a dog area that's got a fake fire hydrant. It's got a container of uh, bags for disposal. And so you do not actually have to walk your dog around the block unless it's at night and then those doors are locked. So you have a choice. You can walk your dog around the block, carry your bag with you, there are trash bins along the streets, or you can use our own uh, dog area in the back. It's got fake grass, <laughs> and uh, there's a bench that you can sit on while your dog explores. So there you are. Dogs get accustomed to the elevators. Um, I happen to be on the second floor, which has direct access to the back which pleased me because again, my dog was getting old. So there you are. 
Thanks, Audrey. Okay, again, if you have other questions, you can either enter them in chat or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and then you can just simply unmute your mic and then ask the question. Is anybody, anybody that I can see here uh, through the videos comfortable with asking a question? If so, you can just raise your hand. If not, or perhaps while you're typing in other questions in chat, there are a couple of others that I can continue to ask our, um, our residents. I know sometimes it's hard to ask the questions over Zoom and the way that things function. So I'll continue for a few more of those. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to continue to use chat. So this one, this one again ties into our, our current experiences here in the community with, um, with the precautions that we're using with um, due to the pandemic right now. I'm wondering with our residents, would anyone like to speak to um, their understanding of what some of the precautions are right now? So how we're, how we're keeping you safe, essentially. What's your understanding of how the leadership team is keeping you safe in the community? Um, Audrey? All right, well, the community leaders are doing several things. First of all, they are in constant touch with your family by sending out memos, uh, either through email or text to your, your children or whoever else is in your family, which is very useful. And at the same time, it's interesting because sometimes my kids will get those memos first and suddenly I'll have a text, mom, you're getting your shot on so-and-so. And we haven't gotten the hard copy yet. So it, they do keep informed, your family informed every single time. As far as what's being happening right now, our dining room is open, <laughs> um, but we are confined to one person at a table because of the requirement that we need to be six feet apart. Uh, ERA is following state requirements. And that's one of the requirements. So it's wonderful to be able to see our fellow residents, even if we have to be six feet apart. But the dining room is open. It will be fully open again next week. They take sanitary precautions. They wipe down the tables. They wipe down the chairs. There is another vehicle. It's actually a rug cleaner, but it's been adapted to spray. And so it comes through the halls and sanitizes the halls uh, once or twice a day, uh, which is helpful also. Um, there are bottles of sanitizer everywhere. We've been taught to sneeze or cough if we have to into our elbows. We've been taught how to deal with the elevator buttons by using either, either your knuckle or your elbow. And so we've been taught how to deal with living during a pandemic. And if we have any questions or concerns, we have a resident social worker counselor who is very helpful in giving us specific information um, with references perhaps to going on the internet or books to read if you happen to have a computer uh, or even a mobile phone available. And so they are taking care of us. Okay, great. Um, Aggie, I think, are, Aggie, are you raising your hand with a question by chance? No, I didn't. Uh, if so, if so uh, Aggie, you're... I think Van oh, so was... I'm sorry, Van. Um, hold on one second, Van. I'm okay. going to come back to you. I think uh, Aggie just unmuted herself to ask a question. Is that correct, Aggie? Yes, yes. I'd okay. like to ask uh, Audrey, all of you, um, during COVID, did you have this experience with Zooms for one another? Were you able to actually speak to one another during the COVID time? Maybe not in the beginning, but now, or are you limited to a phone call? Um, you know, I, I always hear that for older people, it's very important to have real contact with one another. And 
I'm wondering how that would be done. That's a good question. Would anyone like to raise their hand, any panelists, to talk about that at all? Well, all right, I'll... <laughs> Audrey, okay. okay. All right, well, the pandemic is in two parts. In other words, in the beginning, we were under severe lockdown where we had to stay in our apartments. And so the having a phone like this was very helpful because we could text each other. We are in a better situation now because we can leave our apartments as long as you wear your mask. That's vital. We all wear our masks. And if we don't, we are reminded to put on our mask. So during this phase of the pandemic, uh, we are able to see each other because we can leave our apartments. I went out and gardened because I do have a garden box. Uh, the dining room was open. We could go down and um, dine with our friends. We see each other in the halls and we are able to walk around the block. So we are in touch with each other now visibly, which is- Can you knock on each other's door? I mean, not out of the blue, but as a, a, a kind of appointment, can you visit each other's apartment and no. still stay within certain distance? Uh, no, not, not really, no. No. No, and so- um, we, well, really, even at dinner, it sounds like you can't really talk to each other if oh. you're only one at a table. You'd be surprised. Maybe high sign or something, but. You, you would be surprised. Voices carry, and you can sit across from a friend of yours six feet away and have a conversation very nicely. It does not impede you at all. That six okay. foot distance is is not as big as you think. And I so see. we do that. You and do all, that. Oh. Voices carry. We have a very large dining room. Voices carry. <laughs> so you can't talk to more than one person at once. Oh, hi, I'm over here and I look that way. Or hi, I'm over here and I look the other way or directly across. It's not bad. And even if you are waiting to be seated in the living room, it's very easy to talk to one another. I see. Six well, that's wonderful. Apart. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> and the mask does not impede your voice at all. <laughs> and Van, Van, I noticed you raised your hand. Do you have yes, a comment? I, I can? We, we, have a, we have another form of communication, and that is that we all have a ledge outside our door, and we can send uh, messages, cards, gifts back and forth to one another and when times are normal and the pandemic is gone we also have a resident council and uh we're very active with that and uh, i yearn i'm fortunate enough to be the president of that and i can't wait till we can get back and do some of the things we were doing because it was a real adventure of fun great feedback uh, there have been a few more questions that have popped up during the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and re read those for our panelists to answer. Um, and one of the questions is, what happens if a couple moves into the gardens and one of them uh, might need some assisted living services in the future? Uh, where does that person uh, go? Do they move to a part of the community for assisted living? Or does that, do those services come into the same apartment? Would anyone like to address that? If not, I'm happy to explain it, but I bet some of our residents might be able to speak to that a bit. If you need services, does it come into the same apartment or do you have to move for assisted living care? Joe, yes, Joe. I had some skin cancer and needed uh, to change the bandage every day and the, the skin cancer was in my ear so I couldn't change it. Well, uh, the healthcare center uh, put me on assisted living and they come to my apartment and change that 
bandage every day and it's very accommodating in that way. Yeah. That's perfect, Joe. Thank you. And Van? I might add that I've had a mastectomy since I've been here and the nurses were marvelous. They came in and assisted in bandaging and et cetera. And also I no, we'll never know how, but I came up with the virus and uh, the whole place bent over backwards to um, accommodate that and nobody else got it. We were so careful. Thanks, Van, yes. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, whether you're living in an apartment by yourself or if you're living in an apartment as a couple, if you move in independently and you need care services in the future, as it relates to assisted living, whether it's for a temporary type of arrangement like Van explained, or whether you need something uh, permanently moving forward that assisted living comes into the same apartment. Uh, so you don't have to move to a different part of the community. The special part of our community that we were talking about earlier that Dave was sharing information about, the terrace is to help serve those once they reach a more advanced state with memory loss. And there's a, this, the neighborhood, the terrace has a very, very special program that is geared to, to serve uh, that portion of our population. So that would be a different circumstance. But I really appreciate that question. That was a great one. Uh, there are a couple others. So I'm gonna read those next. Uh, this question comes from Mary and Mary is wondering, do you sit and talk to each other in the garden. Audrey, I think you were describing the garden earlier. Maybe you could elaborate. Yes, when you walk out the back, there is a large area uh, that's got tables with umbrellas and chairs, as well as the garden boxes. And last summer, when we were in phase two, it became quite a gathering place. As long as you wore your mask, sat six feet apart, you were able to visit and talk some brought books with them. Um, one, well, person always brought her knitting with her. And so, yes, we were able to do that. Uh, that has stopped because we've moved back into phase one. But as soon as we're out of phase one, I'm sure that will resume again. And so, yes, we were able to sit in the garden and talk with each other. Yes, Dave. Uh, just one thing that I realized hadn't been covered that even now when we have significant limitations, uh, we're back to being able to visit with family members in these tents that we have set up in our in our uh, parking garage and visitors can come for 30 to 40 minutes. My, both of my daughters can come and they can actually come together and visit with me for a half hour or so and then leave. So I'm still able to make that kind of a connection without having to leave and have those kind of visits. And that's op open now, I think, just about every day. That's perfect, Dave. You actually answered the next question that was in the chat, which was with the current restrictions, can family members visit? And so to elaborate just a touch further, Dave was alluding to the tents outside. That's exactly right. At this time for all retirement communities in the state of Washington, visitations inside retirement communities is not allowed right now per recommendations by the governor and public health officials. So as we move into later phases, hopefully that will change. But for now, as Dave, Dave described, the outdoor visits are the way that we do it safely. Um, but, I think I saw a hand go up. Garage, yes, the, the parking garage is an indoor. Um, I would Enclosed, like to bring yeah. you all back shortly after you moved in because, um, you know, we all I probably think about this kind of move um, somewhat ahead of time. So I'd like to know from each of the panelists, within the, the first, I would say, three months after you moved in, what freedoms did you feel you lost? Yes, Van. Well, let's go back to freedom, which we had 
when I first moved in. We didn't have the pandemic to inhibit us. And I didn't feel I lost a single freedom because I could come and go as I wished. And even now I can go down to the foyer and there's benches on either side of it and uh, sufficient room enough so that you can at least see um, a relative. Thank you, Van. Does anybody else have anything to add? Do they feel like they sacrificed something or gave something up in any way? That's a good question, Aggie. Okay, good, okay. You Are have there, very, I very positive people there. You have very, very, very positive thinking people there, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, which is why we're still here. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I think actually, Aggie, you, you raise another really good point, and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Van, is that, you know, um, even during the, the pandemic, it, needless to say, this has been hard on everyone. I don't think anyone would argue that point, but I think that I've heard, I've heard a lot of feedback from a lot of uh, residents living, living here and in other retirement communities that, that tend to see the silver lining in things a lot. And I think just looking at moves in general, whether now during the pandemic or at any point, that a lot of it is really what you make of it. So if you're if you're going into it feeling like I'm giving up my independence, I'm giving up my home of 50 years, if you look at it that way, that's probably what the outcome might be like for you. But if you look at it as I'm going to continue my independence or maybe even gain independence in in these other ways now that I don't have my large home to maintain or other responsibilities, even though your situation might be exactly the same, the way you look at it might mean you could have a totally different outcome. So I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, I'll come back to, to Audrey. I think Van, you had raised your hand um, a second yeah. ago. Do you still have that thought? I wanted to give a real shout out of, of approval and thanks to to the uh, kitchen here during this pandemic. They've served all of our meals uh, to our door, to the handle on our door. And they've gone out of their way to um, see to it that we felt like we weren't totally isolated from the food app. And they're very, very careful about uh, any allergies or that we have or uh, food uh, requirements. It's, it just can't say enough about that phase of it. I can't remember what the other thing there was one other, but I've no. something. You, you made a great point. Thanks, Van and Audrey. All right. So to add to what Van just said, um, we do have on, in, on the first floor the bistro, which is closed right now, but we do have bistro delivering goodies in the morning so that you can get your coffee, you can get a banana or other pieces of fruit like apple or orange or pear, and some breakfast offering like cereal and milk or bagels and cheese, cream cheese or scones or whatever. And so again, this is free of charge and they're taking care of us. But I wanted to say one more thing that's a little bit different. I happen to be someone who has a car here. And so when I moved in, I did not feel I lost any sense of independence because I do have a car. And I appreciated the fact that the car is in a safe location because it's gated. And during this pandemic, yes, I can get in the car and I can drive, I am not restricted. However, I am careful that I merely drive for about a half hour just to make sure my battery doesn't <laughs> dry out because it did one time and I did have to call AAA. So I do make a point of driving my car at least once or twice a week, but I can drive to doctor's appointments for example, um, and uh, so I have not lost that sense of independence. 
And that's great, Audrey. You actually answered one of Gemma's questions in the chat. So thank you for thank you for doing that. There are um, just a couple other questions that we'll probably have time to get through. We have about six minutes before our call. And then again, I promise we'll circle back with you if your question doesn't get answered today. Uh, one of them is about our location. So of course we are in a generally described as a very urban location, very close proximity to shopping, restaurants, boutiques and such. Um, the question is related to that. Are you close to stores in the Bellevue area? Would anyone maybe like to talk a little bit about some of the, the resources in the neighborhood stores and such that they might visit personally mm. or used to before the pandemic? <laughs> well, all right, I'll answer a couple of questions mm. that I saw pop up. There is a mini market directly across from our building. And so it's small, so it's limited, but um, they do have you know, items that you might be interested in. Uh, I think one of the things that I learned how to do through the pandemic was online grocery shopping, which I had never done before. And Life in Richmond does have an arrangement where once a week they shop at QFC for us. Uh, we are limited to five items but we're not limited to the number of items. For example, um, I have gotten Pellegrino sparkling water. So that's one of the items, but I can order like two bottles or three bottles, which would count as one of the items. So they're shopping for us and the cost of what we're buying does get added to our lease and uh, I know our rental payment, but it's the convenience of having them physically shop for us. Online grocery is a hoot. We do it, it's fun when you walk down to the foyer and you always see the bags labeled Amazon Prime. They're there. I've also done online grocery shopping with some of the other grocery stores. So it just opened up a whole new field of using my computer, or if you don't have a computer and you have a phone, use that. It works, it's fine. Thanks, Audrey. I think we'll just, we'll just conclude with um, one last question. And again, any outstanding ones, we'll, we'll circle back to you personally, um, who's asked those questions if you didn't get the answer today. Uh, my last question for, for our panelists would really be, are there any last, last words of advice that you might offer for those who are, are hesitant to move into a retirement community that they that they love at this particular time. Any words of advice about those who are hesitant? I've got one. And I think you should make your move prior to an acute need to do it, because then you can make decisions about how you do it, what you do, and when you do it. And if you wait until you're in a physical condition that forces you to do it, then, then you don't get to have the privilege of choices like uh, I, I felt I had. So uh, move prior to your need is my staunch advice. Move before you really have to and while it can stay in your control and your choice. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Audrey? I also think it's very important to feel comfortable wherever you are moving to. And uh, that was one of the priorities that I looked for. So that there were places I looked at, I didn't feel comfortable in that perhaps the hallways reaped and I knew no they're not taking good care oh one and one more point uh, about living at the gardens you don't have to call a plumber if you have a clogged sink you don't have to call an electrician if something goes wrong with your light switch or your fan or something we have a maintenance online, actually here. And so all it takes is 
calling the front desk or going to the front desk, filling out a work order, and they're there. And I find that's very comfortable. So experiencing the communities when you can, touring them um, to really experience those intangibles, I think is a, is a good point that you'll, you'll really get a sense of how the community feels, which is hard to do by looking at brochures or websites that coming in, sometimes you just know if it feels good or not once you're there. Okay, um, let's see. Dave or Joe, any last words that you wanted to share in terms of advice for anyone before we wrap up today's call? Joe? That's the one thing that I really appreciate is since I can't drive anymore, is the ability for the gardens to take me to the doctor's appointments, any on the east side. And John is very accommodating in that regard. He is great, isn't he? And John is our is our transportation leader here. He's our driver. He's also very talented. He's a musician, so while you're riding with him, he might even he might even provide some free entertainment. He can't play the guitar while he's driving, but he'll do that in the communities at other times too. <laughs> Okay, uh, Dave, anything that you would want to comment on before we wrap up? I just have absolutely no doubt that we made the right move. I have no regret. I'm sorry that uh, I, I lost my wife, but that didn't have anything to do with our being here. In fact, it was helpful that we were here when she was going downhill. And so I'm totally sold on the place and I, and I have no desire to move out. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, great. Again, a special thanks to all of our panelists for, for participating and sharing your words of wisdom today. And thank you again to each of you for, for being our guests and, um, and hearing this feedback. We hope you find it very helpful. Uh, and even if you choose that the gardens isn't the right fit for you, hopefully you've learned some things to help you find the community that really is. And so next you'll receive an email from us that will be asking you for some feedback. So thank you in advance for taking the time to fill that out. It really matters a lot to us. So we appreciate that. Uh, you'll also be hearing from us then within the next few days to talk to you about that little special thank you gift that I mentioned earlier. And of course, to address any other outstanding questions that you might think of later. So. With that, we'll conclude uh, today's conversation and we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks again. Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for